I thank the member for Lindsay. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I give the call to the member for Melbourne. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Australia is going to need to have something to sell to the rest of the world when the rest of the world tells us to stop digging. We are going to need an economy for the 21st century when the mining boom is over. We are never going to be able to compete with China or India on wages. And the strength of the Australian economy in the 21st century is going to be based in large part on our brains. It's going to be based on our brains. And that means doing everything we can here from this place to ensure that our scientists, our researchers and our businesses are well placed to develop the innovative products that will sustain us in the 21st century. And you hear some of the similar rhetoric coming from those on the government benches as they rise to support this bill. You could take the government somewhat seriously were it not for one simple fact. Under the Abbott government, spending on science, research and innovation is at its lowest since records started being kept in the 70s. At its lowest since they started keeping records in the 70s. And we are seeing it played out right here in this parliament now. At the same time as this bill is being debated supposedly to advance and promote the innovation system in this country, the government is also in the Senate seeking support for a bill that would cut the research and development tax concession. Cut the research and development tax concession for companies with turnover above a certain amount. What the government doesn't seem to understand is that that won't just affect those large companies because many of those large companies who get that concession commission research to be done by smaller companies. So it is an attack not just on a few, a handful of companies that can be counted on uh, one or two hands, it is in fact an attack on the innovation ecosystem in this country. And the government's coming at it with another attack, as well as that first attack to limit who can get the R&D tax concession. The government is also coming up and wanting to reduce the rate of the R&D tax concession. They're saying, well, we need to cut it by 1.5 per cent because we're also at some stage in the future going to cut the company tax rate by 1.5 per cent. What's astounding, in a budgetary dream that only those in the government could have thought of, they're cutting the research and development tax concession now without any legislation at all to cut the company tax rate. So they're saying to people now, you can already start receiving less to do research and development in this country. So this bill has to be seen as part of a package of legislation that is about attacking the research and development and innovation system in this country. And then you add to that the budget. The horror budget that people around their country are turning their back on in droves because they know that not only is it a budget that attacks the young and the old and the sick and the poor, it's also a budget that attacks the smart. It's a budget that attacks the smart. And what we're seeing this week, at the same time as we are debating this bill here, we are seeing hundreds and hundreds of jobs being lost from CSIRO. And just as we have one speaker from the government side saying, isn't it wonderful how we have advanced manufacturing in Australia and we need bills like this in order to support it? At the same time, at the same time, a quarter of the workforce is going in Victoria in areas like advanced manufacturing. In areas like advanced manufacturing where they're not only working out how to do more with less, and in some instances use 90 per cent less raw material to produce the same machine part compared with existing methods of manufacture. They're also engaged in the kind of advanced manufacturing that will form the support for areas like the biotech industry. And it's the biotech industry that I want to talk a bit more about now because of its crucial importance to the Australian economy and the failure of this bill and the other budget measures to adequately support that industry. Now, what we know, in, certainly in uh, Melbourne, but right across the country, is that developments in health and medical research are not only good for people, they are good for the country and good for the economy. Since 2009, 
Australia makes more every year exporting health and medical related products than we do exporting cars. Whenever the car industry gets in trouble, it's front page news, and justifiably so, because so many people's livelihoods depend on it. And yet governments think nothing of cutting several hundred million dollars at a time from health and medical research budgets or from the research and development tax support that sustains much of that industry. Now, we, especially in Melbourne, I have visited some of the research institutes, some of the universities and some of the companies who are performing world-leading research and activity. And we have the potential from Melbourne, for example, to be producing bionic pain relief devices that will uh, relieve various kinds of pain in the same way that we've had um, developments in the bionic ear. And we also have the potential, coming in large part from Melbourne together with other areas, for the bionic eye. And yet also, within the last week or so, we have seen Bionic Vision Australia complaining that they are not getting the support from the government that is required to sustain them. But at the same time as providing the necessary support for an innovation ecosystem, which this government is just failing to do, as well as doing that, there's another aspect of Australia and Australian society that we need to preserve that this bill ignores, and that is the public good. Because what we need to do at the same time as ensuring our research sector and our private sector develop the cures and the technologies that will allow us to live healthier and longer and happier lives, we also need to ensure that access to those isn't based on money. We need to ensure that in Australia we remain a place where you only need your Medicare card to get good health care, you don't need your credit card. And to do that, we need a government that is sensitive to both supporting the innovation ecosystem, as this government is not, but that is also capable of supporting the public good. And what we have seen over the last few years is groups of people who have been denied access to the treatments that they require coming to governments to saying, can you please help us? And then when they've been unsuccessful, they've gone to the courts. And they've gone all the way to the High Court. In the case of those who have been restricted access to cancer treatments, they formed a group, Cancer Voices, and together with many others, they commenced litigation. And at various stages they succeeded, at various stages they didn't, and they ended up in the High Court and they lost in the High Court. And along the way, there have been a number of attempts to deal with this issue. How, on the one hand, do we ensure that in Australia we are developing world-leading research and cures and that we give companies the incentives to develop those, but on the other hand ensure that the benefits of those discoveries, which are in large part supported by the taxpayer, are made available to everyone and to those who need it? And Whilst the litigation that was around certain kinds of gene therapies concluded in a way that was not the, the way that was adverse to the, to the plaintiffs, the question hasn't gone away. The question hasn't gone away because there will be new kinds of research and cures and technologies that will be developed, hopefully, by Australian companies. And there will be people who want access to those who say we don't want our access to them restricted just because we can't afford it. And they will say, we want the Australian public health system to support us in that. And we want to make sure that patent laws don't restrict our right to get good quality health care. Because in a rich country like Australia, everyone should be able to access good quality health care. And you shouldn't be turned away because of wealth or because of our laws. And so it is incredibly disappointing in that respect that this bill, coming in the context of an attack on the innovation system generally, also fails to grapple with the other side of the equation, which is what do we do about making sure the cures and research and technology is available to everyone. And this is going to become increasingly important. We only need to look around the world at the moment to see that 
Um, on, the one, on one side of the world, we are facing a crisis with Ebola, and here in Australia, we have researchers who have the capacity to contribute to stopping the spread of that disease and also potentially to curing it or at least to uh, being able to vaccinate people against it. Now, how do we ensure that governments, representative of the public of Australia, have access to that? Previously, the last time a bill like this came before this parliament, it attempted to grapple with that issue. Because what all of the inquiries along the way found was that from both sides of the ledger, from the company's side of the ledger as well as from the public side of the ledger, one of the things that proved a bit of a stumbling block were the crown use provisions, the so-called crown use provisions in this legislation. And what we heard was this. We heard patients saying, look, the government has the power by law to take some of these discoveries and make them available to the general population, but they're just not doing it. And one of the reasons they're not doing it is because, although there's quite a wide-ranging power for the government, there's actually no process set out in the legislation. So even if you wanted to do it, you wouldn't know how to do it. And that's what we found as we lobbied ministers, so the evidence went. We tried to lobby ministers, we tried to get them to do the right thing, and they said, well, this is a very rare power, it's rarely used, I'm not going to use it on this occasion. And on the other hand, you had the companies saying, because it's such a wide-ranging power, we find ourselves, we find that it mainly comes up when uh, we get government departments coming to us and saying, we've got the power to take your uh, invention or your discovery and use it. Um, we've got that power sitting in our back pocket. And so let's sit down now and negotiate an appropriate rate to uh, purchase your discoveries for the use in the public health system. Now, in the context of that, something is crying out to resolve not only that problem that we saw during the breast cancer dispute or the can and the cancer voices dispute, but that is likely to come up again and again and again. Because as there will be more and more new discoveries, and as people's expectations, legitimately so, of better health care increase, these, de these debates are going to continue. And we have an opportunity now to put in place something that might stop that kind of future litigation, that might stop people feeling like they need to go to the High Court to get cancer treatments that they deserve. And it might also give the companies the security that they have to know that Australia is a good place to do your research. because. Once we've perhaps either kicked this government out or changed their mind and got them to lift the spending on science, research and innovation in this country, they'll see it as a good place to come and to continue to do their work. But they'll also know that they have the legal security to do it. And so to that end, um, in the detail stage, I'll be moving some amendments. And the purpose of the amendments is to distill those last few years of disputes and distill those last few years of litigation and to hear the legitimate claims of the industry and to hear the legitimate claims of patients and say, let's put in place a simple process so that if people want to access these crown use provisions because they believe that the invention is not being distributed fairly, there's a simple process set out in the legislation to go to the minister. So I'm going to give the minister any extra powers, so the industry should be uh, comfortable with that. But what it will do is do what the patients have been asking for, which is provide a way to make sure that innovations that are developed here in Australia aren't restricted and kept by a few when they could be saving the lives of many. So I hope that the government will consider these amendments. And uh, I hope indeed that the opposition will as well, because I submit to the House that they struck the right balance. They struck the right balance to ensure that Australia will become an innovation powerhouse and continue to lead the world in areas like health and medical research, but that as we lift our discoveries and as we lift our economy, we're also lifting the standard of public health. And we can have both, and it's not beyond the wit of this House and this Parliament to find a way for us to have both. And so I commend, at a later stage, the amendments to the House. I thank the member for Melbourne. The question